Mega. News team. Admiral Jet. Andrews. W.J. Farrier. Bellinger Scaffolding. East Kent Foods. Blazing Donkey. Harbour Print. Cactus Graphics. Bayless. Exclusive Household. Howden's Insurance. Hollis Motors. Canacol Utilities. Motus. Raoyon Van Hunt. Eurolink. M and T Plumbing. Kent County Council. Steers. Pure Cleaning. And of course you, Dover fans. Because whether you're picking the team, running the club, creating chances, making saves, holding the ball up, bombing down the flanks, taking long throws, taking set pieces, working hard for the team, scoring goals. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Come on, you guys. got Jeremiah with us today. Uh, thanks for joining us, um, to, talking to the Dover fans. Um, so, you, you know, how, how are you enjoying life so far at Dover Athletic? Oh, uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, I didn't expect it to be, you know, this good. So last last season I was at uh, Dulwich Hamlet and it was the most difficult time in my football career. Um, just in terms of the environment that I was in, um, the people around me. And obviously I wasn't hardly played any games um whilst I was at Dulwich. I, I knew I was good enough to play, but you know, circumstances and with the manager and and whatnot, it just I just never got a look in. Um but even whilst not playing, just the way that I was treated, um and yeah, again the people that around me just made me feel very uncomfortable. So I just I was almost, you know, losing that love of football and wanted to quit football and questioning myself if I was ever good enough to play football because the season before that I was playing uh step two National League South and I played over 40 games at that level so then coming to Dulwich Hamlet who were also got relegated and they were in step three I thought oh, okay I should be able to good enough to play this level um so yeah coming into Dover is completely opposite in terms of the managers the players around me you know especially the fans and the people that work at the club it's, it's been amazing, yeah. D Dulwich are sort of an interesting club, aren't they? Because a lot of fans don't actually go to the game for the football, I understand. There's lots of other things going on. Is that right? Yeah. So, you know, you go to Dulwich and you will get, you know, three 3,000 fans on a very good day. It could be a cold Tuesday night and you could get a 1,000 fans. Um, and there, there, there's a lot of them, but it's very different to the Dover fans because, you know, what, what I've seen from Dover fans is they don't stop singing all game long. Um, they actually interact with players um, after the game. I don't want to, you know, be disrespectful and call them real fans, but in terms of yeah, the Dulwich fans, I'll say Dover fans are more footballing people. You know, they actually, you know, care and, you know, love Dover to, and, and very, very passionate compared to the Dulwich fans who, who were good and who are good, but it just wasn't the same type of vibe um, from when you was playing out there. How do you handle situations like that? Because as you say, you played... 40 plus games at in the sixth tier and suddenly you're not getting a look in in the seventh tier and and just as, as well sort of explain to us what happened while you're out of the team and what could have been done better to just make you feel a bit more comfortable and more motivated um so the way I deal with it is um a lot of positive reinforcements like talking to myself I look back at my career you know when I started playing football, um, in terms of like taking football seriously from when I was 16, all the things that I've done. So I look back at my career and I say to myself, oh, look, you've done this, you've done that, you're good enough. Um, also speaking to a lot of people, uh, my friends and family, you know, a lot of my friends play much, much higher level football than me. So I'll speak to them and see, you know, ask for advice and see, how they dealt with certain things and see if I can incorporate it in, within my, you know, my situation. But yeah, I think just the, the positive and just being, I always say to myself, I've got a saying that it doesn't rain forever. And what I mean by that is, you know, you're going through a bad period or a bad patch, but that's not going to last forever. And I knew, you know, the situation I was in at Dulwich wasn't going to last forever. Um, and the only way I could get out of that situation is if I took myself out of it, um, which, which I did um so yeah it was it was very 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 difficult um um i think just speaking to the player i i didn't know where i stood um i didn't know if if i was wanted if i wasn't wanted um i feel like you need to let the player i need to let someone to let me know of why i wasn't playing um how could i get into the squad um just 
being you know transparent because when I was there it was all up in the air um I used to go to training I didn't know if you know if the club liked me if my teammates liked me if my manager liked me you know and it, it was it's not good to feel like that as a as a football player but yeah I'll just say just being very very transparent with that player and just explaining um to them as to why you're not in the squad you're not in the starting 11 re, uh, things you can do to get back into the back into the squads and I feel like that would just it's obviously not a, a nice thing to hear but it will it, I would know where I stood and I could you know if it was I don't know the manager said oh I don't think you're good at heading then I know I can go and improve with my heading you know that kind of thing so so yeah I feel like that, that goes a long way so what did they do did they just not tell you anything did you just like look at the team sheet and you're not on it and that was it uh, yeah, they didn't, didn't tell me nothing at all. It was more of a thing of, so all the players were going to the changing room and then the manager would read the starting 11 and then you read the bench and then the boys who are not involved would just literally just sit in the stands. Um, so I was literally doing that from about, for yeah, from August to January, just in the stands. Um, but yeah, it, it I would say, because in pre-season, I did have like a, quite a bad concussion um so I got a, quite a bad injury so that did set me back so I was always playing catch up but I just don't feel like I got uh the proper chance to you know showcase my my ability and showcase my skills whilst being there now I understand you've uh, you do a lot of work or you're doing some work now about mental health issues in the game obviously there's been a lot of uh publicity about that in recent times just tell us a little bit about what you're doing and how you hope it's going to help others yeah so I started this quite a long time ago so this would have been about four years ago when we had um it wasn't the first lockdown it was this I don't know if you can remember the second lockdown it was like a the winter one yeah and I remember um like a lot of my friends for some reason it was quite weird a lot of my friends were just asking me for advice and you know, I was giving them advice. I was saying, you know, don't worry, you know, be positive or just positive reinforcements. Um, and then I was just sitting in my bed and I was thinking to myself, if two or three of my mates are feeling like this, I can imagine, I can only imagine how many other players, especially in one league, are feeling like this. So I went on Twitter and I made, you know, made a page and made the an account. And literally, I remember like 10 minutes after that, my phone was just messages after messages after messages saying like, oh my gosh, this is really good. Um, a lot of players need this. And I feel like especially players in non-league doesn't get spoken about enough. Obviously, you know, the Premier League and but what professional football is always going to have its spotlight and limelight when it comes to mental health. But I don't feel like, you know, us non-league players, that there's a vocal point or somebody that's pushing um, the mental health aspects for non-league football because I feel like it just is very disregarded compared to professional football. So, yeah, yeah. you know, I'll start that. Um, and you know, through that, I was I've been able to you know speak to so many different footballers. Um, even like one of my biggest achievements is uh, Ipswich Town captain Sam Morsey. He reached out to me and said that, uh, mate, this is an amazing project, and you know he follows all my accounts and he's always looking at my stuff, which is really really good, really really positive for me. Um, but yeah, I just uh, my main thing for this is just being able again to put um, the highlight of mental health into non-league that non-league is very very tough within itself and I'm not even just talking about the football I'm just talking about you know the schedule there's players you know money and it's so so different to professional football that people just don't understand especially for young players as well there's a lot of young players like myself who were in academy who got released and had to uh, you know had to now thankfully I've been able to navigate my way through non-league but there's a lot of players who haven't and you know that They've probably come from playing from a Premier League team and now playing are struggling to get into an eighth or seventh tier football team. Um, so I know there's players like that who are struggling. Um, a lot of my friends at the time were also struggling. So yeah, I'm just just trying to just, you know, create a, a safe space for players to just speak about their emotions and speak about their feelings. Because I, I felt like once I started to speak about how I felt, everything just started to make more sense and it felt like I had weight off my shoulders. So I'm just trying to pass on my own experiences to to other players and other people. Can I ask you, uh, you mentioned about your own release from Academy. Just tell us a little bit about the background, where you were, what happened uh, and how you dealt with it at the time. Because it's very hard, isn't it, when you're at an Academy and then suddenly you're left to your own devices, aren't you? 
Yeah, no, definitely. So I signed my scholarship at Yeovil uh, nine years ago now. I'm getting on a bit uh, when I was 16. Um, so obviously spent two years there and did, did really, really well there. You know, um, I was able to play a pre-season game against uh, AFC Bournemouth, against a lot of Premier League players, trained first team um, a lot. And obviously at this time, Yeovil were a League Two, like an established football league team. Um, so it was a you know massive achievement for me. But yeah, I just remember, you know, going into the meeting uh, by myself and the first team manager just saying to me, yeah, we're not going to offer you a contract. Thanks for your services and good luck for the future. And, and literally that was it. The next day I went to my digs where I was staying with a family, just packed my stuff. And then my mum and dad came and picked me up and, and that was it. And I just remember I was sitting in a car going back to London. And for some reason I wasn't, I wasn't upset. I, was, I didn't cry. I wasn't upset. I was just more of like, a bit confused because it's like I've given my I've given two years to this club, um, my blood, sweat, and tears, and it's just over just like that. So it was a bit of a confusion um, and a bit of panic because it's like, what am I going to do next? Is you know, is there going to be any any other clubs that want to sign me? Um, and also as well, like I I grew up, you know, I say I grew up in in Yeovil. I spent from 16 to 18, crucial crucial time of you know uh, any human's life from 16 to 18. So it was almost like it was Yeovil is was part of me. I know it sounds crazy, but yeah, it was like it was part of me. And now I've got to go back to London and build up build myself up again. So yeah, I was just it was just really a lot of confusion and a lot of panic because I just didn't know where where I was going to you know end up playing football next or even if I was going to carry on playing football. Was I going to go to university? So, so yeah, it was just a, yeah a lot of confusion and a lot of panic um, that I had to deal with. So, what happened? Um, so, at the time, my agent at the time, he said to me that oh, there's um, Reading. I remember I had Reading and Bournemouth under twenty threes, and they were you know watching my games as a, when I was a youth team when I was at Yeovil, sorry, and they said they want to have a look at you in the summer. But then he also said to me, oh, how would you feel about going abroad? And I was like, abroad to where? He's like, oh, to Slovenia. And he was like, Slovenia? I was like, I've, do they even play football there? Like, I've never heard anything about that country. I was just like, don't really know about Slovenia. But then also at the, at the same time, um, two of my good friends uh, are Jaden Sancho and Reese Nelson. So at that time, they was both playing in Germany. So when my agent told me, oh, would you feel about going abroad? I remember I messaged them to you and I said, oh, I know you two are playing both in Germany. What's life like abroad? And they gave me very, very good, um, you know, feedback. You know, so I said to my agent, do you know what? What's the worst thing that can happen? So I went out there to Slovenia for a week, um, did really, really well. And then I just remember, so they said, you were going to offer your, you know, a professional deal. We're going to offer your first deal. You've got to go back to London get your staff and then come straight back to Slovenia. So I remember, you know, I was, you know, excited and I was, oh my gosh, like I've just just signed my first first professional contract. Obviously not in, you know, the in the United Kingdom as, as much as I wanted, but it was still a massive achievement for me. I was still, you know, only an 18 year old boy. Um, so yeah, I just, yeah, I remember going back to London, packing my stuff and heading out to Slovenia to, to, to play football. So what was the name of the club and uh, what was that like? Just tell us about your experiences in Slovenia. Yeah, so the club, I don't want to butcher the name here, but it's called the best, it's called NK Ankaran. And they just got relegated from the Premier Division into Championship Division. So it's very, very good standard. And, you know, so when I was a youth team player, I was used to playing every single game. I didn't know what it was like to, to not play or to sit on the bench or to not be in the squad. So I remember, you know, going to this team and, you know, I'm meeting other players professional footballers who are 10 years older than me, five years older than me. And I'm just like, oh, okay, this is a different ball game now. I'm not in the under 18s anymore. I'm with actual men. I'm with, yeah, like proper footballers. So I remember, you know, the season started and no, sorry, it was a, a pre-season game. And I remember I didn't come on at all in a pre-season game. And I thought, hold on a minute. Doesn't everybody get a little bit of minutes um, in pre-season if it's five minutes, 10 minutes? But yeah, I just didn't get any minutes in pre-season. Hardly got any minutes. So I was, you know, again, a bit a bit of confusion, but I wasn't really into it because, you know, I'm I'm playing for a professional team. But as the season went on, I wasn't, you know, I was on the bench 
you know, wasn't playing. And but what I couldn't, you know, um, comprehend, um, like think about was, I'm only 18. Like, I'm again, I'm a baby of the group. But because I wasn't used to that at Yeovil, I wasn't. I, it just didn't make sense to me. So it did take me about two and a half months to actually make my debut. Um, and whilst I was whilst I wasn't playing, they made me like obviously play for like the reserves, the B team, which I absolutely hated. Like couldn't stand it at all because the standard wasn't wasn't great at all. But again, just, just I just followed the pill and you know go and play for them. So yeah, it took me about two and a half months to to play for the first team, and then once I you know made my debut, I was just in the team straight away, playing every single week, every single week. But the only the major major problem was. The club was in massive financial uh, difficulty, so when it came to like our wages and payment, it was really up and down. It was like one month you would get your full wage, next month it might be half your wage, and then the month after that you've got no wage. So it's just really up and down. Um, and the standard was really, really good. A lot of the teams that I played against are now playing in the UEFA Conference League or even Europa League. So. So yeah, the, st the standard was really, really good. The fans were amazing. You know, you get like crazy, crazy fans. And sometimes before a game, our team will, will go to like the local cafe for like a walk. And a, a lot of our fans will come to us and they will say, oh, I'll give you 100 euros if you get yellow cards. I'll give you I'll give you 200 euros if you get a red card. Obviously, you didn't go through with it, but you can just, yeah, just trying to pitch you how crazy and how passionate the fans were. Yeah, and then also showed you, by the way, the perils of of, of gambling and 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 and, and you, you know, and footballers have to be careful about that. We we've yeah. seen a lot of players get banned for for betting themselves, yeah. obviously, on games and stuff. But, yeah, but it's very you know, and it can be tempting, can't it, for a young professional if someone's offering yeah. them money to do something, you know, like like get booked. Yeah, yeah, you know, of course, especially at the, at the time, you know, I was I was getting paid getting paid peanuts, and also I wasn't also getting my full wage at the time, so. Of course, it was very tempting to just take that 200 euros in cash and go and get myself a yellow card. But obviously, that's not that's not the way I play. I'm I'm far from that. Yeah, definitely. Well, you've just name dropped two superstars there. How do you know those fellas? Uh, well, with Reese Reese Nelson, uh, we went to the same school, so a school in South London called London Nautical. It's like a sports college slash navy school. Um, so yeah, I've known him since year seven so that would be since i was 11 years old all the way until now still still quite still very close you know still seeing quite often and speak a lot about football and um he gives me a lot of advice as well and with Jaden sancho uh, so when i was about 13 14 i was on trial at watford and obviously that's where he started his career so i became close with him then but then also it it worked hand in hand because him and reese also grew up together uh, when they were little kids so we all kind of obviously just kind of same circle, uh, became good mates, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it must be great uh, being, you know, having people of that calibre to fall back on as friends. And, and when you're going through tough times, they must be good people to talk to. Um, most definitely, like all the time, especially with uh, with Reese and the way his career kind of uh, panned out Arsenal. Um, not the way that he kind of wanted, to, wanted it to be or the way we all thought it was going to be. Obviously, he's enjoying life now at Fulham. But yeah, when, whenever I'm going through something difficult, you know, I can, you know, speak to them and ask for advice. And one thing that I've noticed that it doesn't matter what level you're playing, you could be playing Premier League all the way down to, you know, sixth, seventh tier of football. We all go through the exact same thing. Obviously, yes, at the end of the month, they're going to get a massive paycheck compared to me. But if you take all the money out of it, is it's all the same, exactly the same situations we all go through. So yeah, it's really good that I'm, you know, able to speak to players of that calibre. Yeah. And do they know about your mental health, uh, um, you, you know, um, initiative? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I would say I'm much more closer with Reese because obviously we went to the same school. So when speaking with, you know, with Reese, he he says, you know, it's a really, really good thing you're doing. And he's always encouraging me to, to push it and to, you know, put a lot of time into it and, he really thinks, you know, it's a very good idea because he says that, you know, the mental side from whatever level you're playing at, you know, doesn't get speaking enough, speaking about enough. So, yeah, they, they, you know, they know about it and, you know, always encouraging me to keep on going with it. Obviously, you also played football with with Reese when you were at school. <laughs> what was that like? Honestly, it's, uh, the fakest, the the best, one of the best, well, if not the best player I've ever played with. Um, yeah, he's 
ever since we was young, since 11, we would, there'll be like one football in the playground and there'll be like 100 kids trying to get the ball off him and he was just weaving in and out of players. And even with Sancho himself, um, when I was at Watford, um, trial at Watford and seeing the way he plays and just seeing the way they both obviously have grown up and the careers they're having now, it's no surprise to me of, as to why, you know, they are where they are now. Yeah, no, good. And when you came back to him, just tell us your journey from, obviously, from leaving Slovenia to, you know, obviously we, we know about Dulwich. Just tell us your journey from there to Dulwich. Didn't really know what to do, speaking to my agent. And he said to me, oh, what about, again, I didn't know nothing about non-league. I used to think, you know, non-league was the worst. I used to think non-league was like Sunday league football, like pub football. I used to think anyone who plays non-league is rubbish at football. They're not good enough. I will never, ever play non-league football. So I had that type of, you know, big time Charlie mentality in my head. So then another person reached out to me and said, oh, I've come across your profile. Do you want to, how would you feel about going to play in Sweden? And I said, oh, okay, Sweden is that, that I've heard good things about Sweden and everybody knows about Sweden national team um, and the country's really nice and all that kind of things. So I said, you know what, uh, why not? Let's, let's go out to Sweden. Um, Sweden was, I don't know, it was a weird kind of experience because I, I didn't really get along with the manager. And the manager was, it was actually an English manager. And we had a lot of English players, which was really good. We all lived in one big, like massive house. I think it must have been about six or seven bedrooms. All of us from, so boys from London, boys from Scotland, boys from Newcastle, all over the, the United Kingdom, everywhere. Um, and in that aspect, it was really good. But on the pitch, I didn't, yeah, I didn't really get along with the manager. Um, so I only stayed for a few months and then came back uh, because of COVID. COVID was happening, so I came back to the UK. But then once the restrictions got lifted, I went on trial to Hungerford. Again, at this point, I'm only 20 years old. Hungerford, Hungerford were step two at the time. Uh, so I've gone in there done really, really well again. And, you know, to, the manager said to me, oh yeah, we're going to offer you this amount of money. I said, oh, that's fine. I just want to play football at a good level. And then it got to like, where I should have, the day I should have been signing. And then he sent me a message and he said to me, oh yeah, sorry, Jez, I'm going to go with more of an experienced centre back rather than yourself. And I just said to myself, oh my goodness, I can't catch a break right now, can I? But again, it's a, it's a lesson that I had to learn because I was starting to realise that, again, a young player in, in senior football is very, very difficult to, to play every single week at a very high level. So then I've, my agent said to me, OK, Enfield Town, how do you feel about going to Enfield Town? And again, I said to myself, what, Enfield, what's Enfield Town? I've never heard of them. They're rubbish. I'm not going to Enfield. And he said, listen, you've got nothing to lose. He said, I've got, I haven't got anything for you at the moment. Enfield Town need a centre-back that fits your profile. So I said, you know what, okay, let's just go. So I've gone into like, my first training session, done really well, played pre-season games, um, done really well. Eventually they signed me. Um, and then like first game of the season, just started playing. I was playing every single week, every single week. But then another lockdown happened. So then they had to cancel the season. So again, things are going through my mind. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, like I've gone to Slovenia, they've messed up with my wages. I've gone to Sweden, haven't got along with a manager. Um, I've come back to the UK, COVID's happened. I've gone to Hungerford, they didn't uh, sign me in the end. Now I'm at Enfield and COVID's happened. I'm just like, cannot catch a break. So obviously as you know, time went on, Enfield said, oh, we really want to keep you um, for next season. And I didn't have anything planned or any other offers. So I said, yeah, definitely I'll re-sign with you lot. So I ended up re-signing for them. And till this day, this my best, best ever season in terms of we finished third or second. We finished second in the league, mm. uh, just behind Worthing. We lost in the playoffs, unfortunately. But in terms of just like my development as a player, um, putting myself on the non-league map in terms of people knowing about me, um, especially at step three level, you know, I really, I ended up playing over 40 games that season, just playing week in, week out. So it was an amazing season. And then funny enough, that summer, Hungerford came back in for me. And Hungerford said, oh, like we've been watching you and 
you've developed really, really well. We want to make you an offer. So then I ended up signing for Hungerford, um, which was like really, really funny. It's just because it's just like a full circle moment. It's like a few years ago, you said I was too young and now you want to sign me. So yeah, I went to Hungerford. Um, and again, that was a good season personally for me in terms of playing over 40 games at the sixth tier, you know, step two, National League South level. We did get relegated, but because I played so many games and, you know, I developed really well, you know, as a player, again, it did put me more out there in the non-league, the non-league world, the non-league map, however you want to call it. Um, and then, yeah, after that season, uh, ended up signing for Dulwich Hamlet. So, of course, now you're at Dover Athletic and, you know, you've been in and out of the side. Um, so what's the difference between Dover and Dulwich? I mean, I'm assuming Jake's very much more transparent and he's telling you what you've got to do to improve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I've been, you know, in and out of, this, in and out of the team. Um, and obviously, any player wants to be playing you know, every single week. But one thing I will say with the gaffer and with Mike is that, again, very, very transparent. You know, they've... They've come up to me and, you know, they've told me reasons why as as to why I'm not, you know, starting every single game. They've said that the games that I have played in, I've done, you know, done well, done really well. And obviously the two center, the two other centre backs we have within Luca and JT, you know, they have this really good partnership from from last season. And they've been doing really, really well, you know, as a pair together. I think we've got three clean sheets in a row now. Yeah. So you know, it's more of a thing of where I know where I stand. It's not like I will never play again for Dover or, or I'll never get, you know, a look in ever again. Um, I'm just, you know, very grateful and thankful, you know, to the gaffer and to Mike themselves that, you know, every single week they know, they say to me, oh, you know, I know you're probably frustrated, you know, that, that you should be playing or you want to be playing more minutes. But, you know, they've, they've said to me that, you know, you're an important player to this team on and off the pitch, you know, you know, I'm 25 years old, but I'm one of the oldest within the group because our group is so, so young. So it's, it's, it's a big type of role that, you know, I'm not really, I'm not really used to, but, you know, I'm trying to adapt in terms of to be, you know, like a leader on and off the pitch. We had a friendly against Tombridge, uh, Tombridge Angels about two weeks ago. So with all the players that haven't been getting a lot of minutes and with Trialist and with the Academy boys, and, you know, and, and they made me captain for that game. So, you know, little things like that, it does make me feel, you know, that I've got a bit of, you know, I wouldn't say authority, but I've got, you know, I'm, I'm a player that they see that, you know, a big player for the team. And yeah, I think it's just completely, the situation that I'm in now compared to when I was at Dunwich is just completely different. Who, who won that game, by the way? Uh, we drew 2-2. Yeah, it was a behind, it was a behind a closed door game, just a, just yeah. a friend to get some minutes in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, you know, when you're out of the side, you have to work on things. And as you say, they've been transparent. They've told you what you've got to work on. So is that something that you're actively doing? Are you looking at your own game? And I know it's hard because you're part-time. I know you work as a teacher. Um, you know, is it hard to find the time to dedicate to the things that you've got to do to get into the team? Yeah, it is It is definitely hard. But, you know, again, I'm used to... But I've been full, I've been a full-time, you know, player. So... I always say that I'm, I will always, even though I'm playing semi professional now, I'll always be a professional um, within my mindset. So even if it's, I finish work and I've got to go to the gym and I've got to do, you know, do the extras, or maybe if on a Saturday I didn't play a lot of minutes on the Sunday, you know, I might go do a training session or play a bit of football. So I'm always doing something um, to, you know, to keep myself fit because. You know, there's only three and a half, one injury away, one red card away, and you're straight in. So I always make sure that I'm always ready just in case anything happens. Just tell us a little bit about your job. The area that my school resides in is in northwest London. So we have lots of um, like asylum seekers come um, from Arabic countries, like from like Syria, from Iraq, who've come from really, really terrible backgrounds and of course they come to the UK. And the, the school that I'm in, we accept um, a lot of them. So when they come in, obviously they can't speak no English, they can't read, they can't write. So my job is to, you know, integrate them into the school, help them with their English, help them with their maths, you know, with their reading, all the all them sort of things. That's that's what I do to help them. Um, as well as you know, we we've got some bad bad badly behaved children as well. So it's also like my role to sometimes you know speak to them and mentor them and just you know help them with whatever they're going through. So it all kind of 
it all kind of intertwines with the mental health things as well um, when I'm talking to these kids and helping them with with what they're going through as well.